Greetings. My name is Kevin Reddick, and I welcome you to my channel, Conversations from the Hot Box. Here we are passionate about discussing real life issues, and we do so from a Christian biblical perspective. Today's conversation addresses the question, well, actually, it's a twofold question, or uh, rather, two titles, put it that way. Uh, what are you looking at, or uh, what are you focusing on? and the danger of, of misguided focus. So jump in the car and let's ride. I remember growing up in Newark, New Jersey, and this is possibly true for a lot of other places, where the question of what are you looking at could lead to a physical fight. <laughs> so I, I find it amazing that the same question in the spiritual religious arena could and sometimes sometimes should lead to a spiritual mental fight. And since I'm not afraid of you, I'm going to ask you the question. What, what, what are you looking at? What are you focusing on in this period, this season in your life? Now, you may think that this is a personal question, and quite honestly, it is. But have you ever stopped to consider that what you are focusing on doesn't just affect you? Many of us are consumed with our own interests, our careers, our families, and personal success. And while these are things that are important, I urge you to take a step back and think about the impact your focus is having on those around you. When we are so focused on our interests, we become blind to the needs of others. We miss out on opportunities to help someone in need, to, to make a positive impact in our community, or to simply lend a listening ear to a friend. Our tunnel vision can lead to missed opportunities for growth and personal development. In the book of Matthew, chapter uh, 6, verses 22, 23, he tells us the eye is the light of the body. If your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. If your eye is bad, your whole body will be dark. If the light in you is dark, then how dark will it be? And this is, that's out of the New Life version. Now, these two scriptures are in the middle of uh, two other thoughts on heart and treasure and God and money. Matthew 6.21 points out that the storage place of one's treasure is either the earth or heaven. Where one chooses to store one's treasure is where one's heart will be focused. So in that, it creates a somewhat of a three-tier point of revelation that reinforces the same underlying message of focus. You see, in the first tier, our focus is to be on heavenly treasure. In the third tier, our focus is to be on serving God. In the second or middle tier, it reveals the results based on the choices made on the other two tiers. <laughs> And those tears involve the choice of what to focus on. The eye is pictured as a representative of the whole body. Either in Matthew, I mean, excuse me, earlier in Matthew, Jesus indicated that the eye can cause us to sin. And with the eye also being an instrument of focus, then what we focus on can cause us to sin by commission or omission. And therefore, our focus must not be left on God. And sometimes spiritual guarding requires a spiritual fight. In Hebrews chapter 2, I mean chapter 12, verse 2, it informs us that we are to keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We are to maintain our focus on Jesus. If the devil gets in the, gets his way, then we need to resist him in order to prevent him from getting his way. Resist him fervently and continue to pursue Jesus. If we focus on evil and the demonic, 
both real and perceived, we are eventually ensnared by its seduction. You see, what, what we focus on becomes our source of direction. And if your focus is steered off course long enough, it becomes your destination. In my study of this, I discovered that the word or concept for Jesus, I mean, of focus, rather, I got Jesus on my mind. The concept of focus is found in over 300 scriptures. Focus is defined as the center of interest or activity, uh, the state or quality of having or producing clear visual definition or to pay particular attention to. Focus has a powerful revealing factor, and this can be observed when Jesus visited the home of Mary and Martha. One was focused on tasks, cleaning the house and getting things prepared. The other was focused on relationship where she gave Jesus attention. Misguided focus leads us to try to replace work or busyness with intimacy with God. And this can cause us to attach importance to the things of God rather than God himself. Focusing on ceremonies, rules, and obligations, yet having no sense of intimacy and communion with God. They attempt to gain God's attention with work and task completion, but God's deepest desire is to have fellowship with us. In studying church history, I found in the book of Acts, I discovered that the disciples were Plug it with opportunities to participate in God's work and see instant results. As they sought God's guidance and struggled to accommodate all of the growth that they were seeing, they devoted themselves to keeping focus on the main things. With determination, they set out to focus on four key areas revealed in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to pray. The apostles understood their priorities and, when challenged with other considerations, in the wisdom of God, they chose instead to focus on giving themselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the Word of God, according to Acts 6 and 4. And by maintaining their focus, they remain plugged into God. And as a result, they maintained an intentional focus that alerted them to the needs and opportunities around them to effectively serve their community. Matthew uh, uh, chapter 9, 12, uh, Mark 2, 17, and Luke 5, 31 share situations where God's focus was on mercy, for example, and the Pharisees' focus was on sacrifice. God's focus was on compassion, and the Pharisees' focus was on ritual. God's focus was on the deepest of human needs, and the Pharisees' focus was on outward appearances. It was Jesus who socialized with sinners, who reflected the heart of God, not the Pharisees who criticized him for doing so. This happens because of unguarded focus. It can open the door to compromise. And when we are so fixated on our goals and desires, we may be willing to compromise our values and principles in order to get ahead. This not only affects us, but those who look up to us and depend on us. Is it worth sacrificing our integrity for temporary success or at least the appearance of it? Distractions are another consequence of unguarded focus. We live in a world filled with constant distractions, social media, notifications, endless tasks and responsibilities. 
And if we're not mindful of our focus, we can easily get sidetracked and waste precious time that could have been used for something more meaningful. What a reminder this is. How often do we forget that Christ's church is purposeful sinners and not a club for the respectable? And how often do we feel so uncomfortable with sinners and the so-called demon possessed that we, like the Pharisees, not only keep our distance, but we criticize those who are willing to connect with them? We attach negative labels and demonize them to justify the misguided focus of fear, greed, hate, and blame. Just watch or or listen to the news. It's filled with it. And a lot of it is coming from those who say that they are Christians, believers in Jesus Christ, followers of Jesus Christ. But Jesus came not to conform the righteous but to call sinners to repentance. I didn't come to Jesus because I was righteous. I came to Jesus because I was a sinner and one of the worst ones. So we we, we need to look to him again and remember that God places his priority on mercy, not sacrifice. In Psalms 1937, it says, Turn turn my eyes away from looking at what is worthless. This psalm refers to all the worldly idols of power, wealth, uh, uh, pleasure, self-righteousness, man's praise and acceptance or help, in which happiness and peace are sought apart from God. Here, the writer is communicating that where one looks becomes one's focus. The word translated worthless seems to have two basic and interrelated senses, ineffectiveness and falseness. The latter probably being derived from the idea that hopes and expectations prove false when placed in persons or things that are ineffective and therefore untrustworthy. And because the psalmist's own inclination is toward falseness, he expresses his need for the Lord to focus his attention on the right way because God's way leads away from what is foolish and false. Now more than ever, we need to keep this prayer lifted up before the Lord. We are being bombarded with uh, lies like never before. They are attacking both our entry points of the soul, which are our eyes and our ears. In this age of social media and mainstream uh, media video productions of their context, printing our, our, our written material is in decline. Therefore, more people are listening or hearing information as opposed to reading it. And listening requires a different level of focus than reading. One of the things that we may forget if we've been trained in academic settings for a long time is that sermons are for listeners and not for readers. Listeners don't have the opportunity to go back and read the previous paragraph. They're not even uh, hitting the playback button if they're sitting in church. They can't. They have less inclination or even opportunity for deciphering uh, uh, what we're saying. So having a central theme and having all the aspects of the message keep plugging back to the central message gives listeners the ability to truly grasp what we're saying. The answer to the question what you're looking at is connected to what or who you are listening to. Paul in Romans 8 uh, verses 5 through 11 tells us those who let their sinful old selves tell them what to do live under that power of their sinful old selves. But those who let the Holy Spirit 
tell them what to do are under his power. If your sinful old self is the boss over your mind, it leads to death. But if the Holy Spirit is the boss over your mind, it leads to life and peace. And that's out of the New Life Version. Those who live according to the, to the Spirit can fulfill the intent of the law because those who are uh, uh, living according to the Spirit focus their minds on spiritual things, while those who are according to the flesh focus their minds on fleshly things. And verse 6 describes the result of these two ways of thinking. The fleshly mindset is death. But the spiritual mindset is life and peace. I urge you to consider the bigger picture. Your focus is not just about you. It has a ripple effect on those around you. So are you being a positive influence? Are you making a difference in the lives of others? Are you being the best version of yourself? And let's not forget about disappointment. When we are solely focused on one aspect of our lives, be it political, financial, relational, or social, it becomes our sole source of happiness and fulfillment. When things don't go according to plan, it can lead to disappointment and even depression. If we are to have a balanced focus, with our eyes set on multiple areas of our lives, we are better equipped to handle setbacks and disappointments. So take a moment to reflect on your focus and how you can use it to embedder yourself, your family, your community, and those God has called you to impact. Well, thank you for taking this journey with me and Remember, let your focus lead you toward being found pleasing to God. So my challenge to you is this. Take a moment to reassess your focus. Are you too narrowly focused on one aspect of your life? Are you neglecting other important areas? Remember, your focus is not only impacting you, but those around you. So let us strive to be more mindful of what we are focusing on to enable us to make a greater positive impact in the world. Again, I say thank you for joining me on this journey today of discovering the power of focus. What say you? Hope you enjoyed the ride. Like us. Please hit the subscribe button and notification buttons and we visit our channel for more engaging and enlightening video. If you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please click on the button above labeled Prayer of Salvation or the link in the description below. Otherwise, thank you for spending some of your time with me. And as always, peace and blessings to you and your household.